pleased that you're all with us. We're pleased to have Sandra with us this morning for the presentation, and I'll do that introduction in just a minute. Um, but I always like to start out by thanking our sponsors. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, you know, we've got several sponsors who have helped to support these efforts in Michigan to be talking about competency-based education. I say in Michigan, that was the original intent, um, but obviously that's gone beyond that because um, a lot of people through LinkedIn and various other social media have heard about the webinars and are watching closely. It's very nice to see a broad group of, of interest. Uh, Michigan Virtual is our online school here in in Michigan. They're actually not a school, but they're, they're, they're an online provider and they're always very supportive of all the efforts from EdTech specialists. We also have My Virtual Academy, and then ThinkSpace is a, um, an uh, area in Lansing that a new conference center, <clears throat> and I encourage you to kind of look into all of these sponsors. Um, and then, you know, one of the other sponsors is EdTech Specialists, you know, and that's where I am the president and CEO, and Lisa's on with us today to help organize this, and we've got some of the other consultants also joining us. So we're glad, glad, glad that you can be with us. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure to have people on with us who maybe haven't been before. And I think we have a few of you today. So again, if any of you want to share where you're from, um, we'd love to know. We've you know gotten people across the country. Um, and then you know, one of the nice things about these the recorded versions is that we have people who are looking to this to uh, kind of create conversation in their district by putting some. Um, developing some professional development around that. So uh, that's always a, a real plus to, to know that we're, you know, kind of reaching out um, all in all different ways. Uh, that's, that's what kind of this is about. When we look at competency and some of the pre-conversation we had here this morning, um, not that we're going for competency, but when you have something in a recorded version, people can go in any time and revisit and redo. Those are the kinds of opportunities we really are kind of seeking for our students and our kids um, as well. So the point <coughs> for asking questions is um, you, you'll see on your, uh, you know, on your screen there that you've got a control panel where you can, there's a chat section. You're very, very welcome to put something in there. And Lisa or Sandra will be happy to um, restate the question and is, that isn't recorded. And then Sandra can answer for us. Or if you want to talk to Sandra, Sandra's wide open to just you know, put it in the chat that you'd like to ask her a question verbally, and we'll open up the microphone, and you can ask that way. So um, we'll get going with that in just a couple of minutes. Um, one of the, the pleasures I've had over the course of putting these webinars together is getting to know some new people. Sandra and I hadn't met before. Um, I contacted her and asked if she might do a webinar for our series. And she very graciously immediately accepted. And through our emails and phone conversations and our trial run yesterday, we've had a um, we've gotten to know each other, and it's just a real pleasure to be making new friends and, and getting to know new people and new ideas. So, um, and and as you if you looked at Sandra's background and her bio, you'll see that she's just about done everything in education. And um, including, and, and Mike, I know you're on, we're going to let this one thing we'll get back to, but with the Department of Defense. And Mike, that is what she did. So we're going to see if you guys were over there at the same time. That would make it a real small world. Um, so I learned a lot about Sandra. And one of the other things I learned yesterday during our, our uh, kind of preparation for today was that she's also a very proud grandma. I got to see pictures of her grandkids on her desktop as we were learning how to convert back and forth to the presenters. So that's another big, a big a part of your life, I'm sure, Sandra. So that was fun. So what I'd like to do right now is I think I will just kind of pass the baton over. Lisa will give you the presenter tool, and we will go from there. And I thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'm trying to get to presenter mode here, and it's not showing. I'm going to have to close this off. No, I'm not leaving the meeting. <laughs> um, I might not be able to get to present here. I'll do it this way.
So thank you, Marcia, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm feeling very um, excited to be included among the national experts that you have chosen for this um, webinar series. There's some really um, informed and very highly esteemed people included here, and so I'm hoping that people will listen to all the series and, and see what is happening across the nation. I start with this slide because as you're getting a chance to read through this, listening to me, you can get a, a sense of how students feel about this. Um, Elizabeth was a student at Muscatine High School when they started this whole concept of competency-based and was invited into their leadership team. They had students on their team to get their feedback. This is part of her uh, application, college application uh, essay. And she, uh, at the time, said, which is why I can have her full name on here because she's actually an adult and has given me that permission now. She uh, said she didn't want to do CB at first. When she first heard about it, she thought it was just going to be awful. And then realized that she's saying right here that it was life-changing, taught her to be open-minded. And she says that as she's gone on to college, she sees education in a completely different way now because of that experience. So let's go back a little bit to the Iowa journey, which is why you um, are tuning in today, is to find out how we've come from point A to point B and are looking down the road to C, D, and F um, along the way. So we began, it began as a state board priority in 2010, just as, the, as a conversation. Somebody said, you really need to investigate this, and they did. They brought Fred Bramante in from New Hampshire, where it had gotten started. And they were so excited that they set up a task force and I was able to lead that task force for the state board because at that time I was the consultant for 21st century skills and they thought that really fit. We developed some state guidelines and they are, um, that's actually a live link there, but that tiny URL is at the top of every screen. So if you're trying to jot that down really quickly, it's going to be at the top of every screen. And those give you our principles, our definitions, some examples. We're in the process of revising those. The examples are what the part I'm working on right now, but everything up to the examples have been um, reworked recently. Now, the governor mentioned it in his blueprint on education, and then we had a forum in 2011 where we were, had room for 300 people and it filled in two and a half hours. It was amazing. People, that showed us that people were definitely interested. So we began to talk to the legislature and realized that there were some things that needed to change. They were amiable. In fact, we actually have uh, bipartisan support in both houses for these kinds of changes. And immediately when we asked that first year in 2011, eliminated the Carnegie unit as the only way to earn credit in Iowa or to move uh, for graduation. We could have done this K-8 and most states probably could do it K-8 because it's not based on time. The Carnegie unit at the high school level is what inhibits it. Then we started looking and every state's going to have to look. It would be good to have somebody who understands CBE look at your state, uh, like, uh, probably at your rule. We call it chapter 12, but um, whatever that administrative rule is, and begin to see what things are in there that might inhibit it. For example, we had to change a code and, and a rule that you could only teach one thing at a time in a classroom. And the reason that's restrictive is because if as an Algebra 1 teacher, I would notice that I have a student who really should be in Algebra 2, but I can't move that student to Algebra 2 because in my tiny little district, Algebra 2 is taught opposite of his English class. So we have to be able to keep them in the same class. And then credit earned before ninth grade was restricted to just the four content areas. And we said, well, why not in computer? Why not in um, industrial arts? Why not in something else? So that, um, that was another one we changed. So I'm just saying those examples so that you'll get an idea of the kinds of things that you need to look at. And the local school districts then need to look at their own because often their definition of unit or their graduation requirements will have an inhibit, something that inhibits them right there. So the next thing that the, we did was start this Iowa CB collaborative, which is, I think, what you heard about and why you were interested in our work here, Marsha. And that is that uh, we were... Uh, given this grant from the some funding to give grants to schools, small grants, it's only $100,000 and they share that, but it gets them to Des Moines once a month for meetings and gives them a little bit of um, money to do some a few other things. 
So these 10 districts are our collaborative. And then we said we can't really do any of this change that we want without our colleges and universities and AEA. So we invited them to come along with us. So we have about 140 people who come together. This year we've decided to meet every other month so that they have one full day that they are responsible to do something in their district in some kind of a collaborative inquiry where they're working toward this work. So until now it's been once a month commitment, which has been quite a commitment. Then how we see this process is we have the ultimate goal of more students being really truly college and career ready. But these two boxes in the middle that you see are um, where we're headed. We would like to have a framework for this transition so that other people can follow along. And then we want to have demonstration sites right here in Iowa so that people don't have to fly to California or New Hampshire to see an example that they can drive down the road and find one. And when I say the framework, what we're trying to do is something that would include these areas. So something that says, here's how you would get started. Here's how you engage your stakeholders. And then we have this, uh, this group of three about the learning environment, the competencies, and the assessment. And then all those peripheral things, what does it mean to do collaborative inquiry? What's the professional learning? What's the structure and supports? And all of that centers around this blue one that says, the learning environment and what are we going to do for students. So each one of those elements then will have in it an overview with definition and those kinds of things, some resources, uh, tools and protocols to use, and then some see it in action. So that's, what, that's one of our main goals, uh, just to have that for other districts to follow. In the process of doing this work, of course, those guidelines had to be developed and we had to come up with something that said this is what it means to be CBE. We borrowed from iNACL with um, all of Susan Patrick and Chris Sturgis's work on all of what they've done has been amazing. And after a couple of years of working with this, we, we did a little bit of a tweak. So mostly these are the same as iNACL, except that we realized that number two and number five were about competencies. So we combined them into one and added this at the bottom because we feel very strongly that all learning must be validated whenever, wherever it happens. Students acquire the learning or demonstrate the learning. It doesn't matter when that happens. So if you design and create clothing in 4-H, you can use that as clothing one credit and actually get credit and move on. So these are the principles and what we see Say about CBE is somebody asks me, does the district have to be doing all of these things? And my, my answer is the district needs to buy into all of these things, to believe all these things, and to be working toward all of these things in order to really truly be competency-based. Because students have to move on when they demonstrate proficiency, and, that, and the competencies have to be connected to those things. And I should say that that word universal construct in there is what we in Iowa call the 21st century skills creativity and critical thinking and those kinds of things. So that, that's what our principles are. And then people continually ask, but what, what does it look like in a classroom? What it, what's it look like, sound like? So we were trying to find videos and different things, but decided that we really need to put this down on paper. That um, when you get to a CBE system, what will you have? And we felt like there were actually 10 things. So we have these 10 characteristics that kind of operationalize this, those principles. This, um, then these are the first five, that internal and external stakeholder, and that is key. That's foundational, as well as a cultural um, continual improvement, that collaborative inquiry, continually trying new things, failing fast and failing forward, and just keep going. And then, of course, policies and procedures, and I'll show you some competencies and scoring guides in, um, in just a few minutes. And then the assessments are meaningful and positive experience for those students. We're talking about performance assessments that, and I'm actually calling it assessment as learning. We have assessment for and assessment of, but if the assessment is the learning so that you negotiate what the student's going to do, and through the process of doing it, they're learning, but they're also coming up with their product or their, pro or their presentation or whatever it is at the end, then the assessment and the learning are tied together. And then the, the last five are more um, about how the couple are in the middle about that student-centered and personalized. So we're 
going a little beyond what it means to be competency-based and saying that included in this really is individual student passions and connections and those kinds of things. And then um, that leadership is um, shared throughout the system, credit, we already talked about that a little bit, then each one of these things has indicators underneath it and you can find them at, if you go to this website that's in the bottom, in the middle, and the blue thing that says IA Comp Ed, um, there are, there's a tab there called um, planning for this change. So we had to say, what is a competency? This is different from a standard. A competency is based on this enduring understanding, requires transfer, and dispositions must be included in this. So the universal constructs are 21st century skills. Then a very key thing is proficiency is demonstrating that you could actually use this at a higher level or to do something else with it. Um, and that's key because in a competency-based environment, we're pretty much eliminating, well, we're eliminating Fs, we're eliminating zeros, we're eliminating Ds, maybe even a C, because if you're really going to use this, you're not moving on until you're ready to use it, you're probably more in the A or the B range, even though we're not using the percentages and those kinds of things. Uh, personalized learning, there are some examples of those in um, Kettle Moraine, Wisconsin, and then I don't know if you've ever seen this John Hunter video. If you just Google John Hunter fourth grade world peace game, you'll see some amazing things because people think fourth graders can't do this, but um, we can change education from preschool up with these kinds of things. Two big questions that we always get are what's happened, what about post-secondary? So that's why we have this group of people and they're looking at how do we transition and some of these other things. And then what about sports and activities? And those sports and activities are, um, those people are in conversation with us, including the NCAA. I don't know if Susan Patrick talked about it when she was here, but um, when she was on your session, but they really have worked together quite a bit to make sure that those, those kinds of conversations are happening. So a little bit about competencies in Iowa. We're seeing them different from standards. They're really a, a relationship among all of these things that you see on the screen so that they're, they come together. And we see there's two ways to write them. You can either start with your standards and look at your keywords and figure out what's happening with all of those standards and clump them together to write a competency. But we chose this way. What do you want those graduates to walk like, talk like, sound like, think like when they cross your stage? What is it they're going to need to know and be able to do in five, ten years out? So you have to take off your discipline hat and think globally. What are the most important skills they need to be successful? Um, usually that comes up to what I told you we call the universal constructs. So these are the, the ones that we use, those four C's plus the two there at the bottom of the screen, flexibility and productivity. And then when we started to look at competencies, we realized that as we were writing them, we were coming up with a what, a how, and a why in each one. And so we just really ended up writing them that way. What is the student doing? How is, how is it going to happen and why? The why being the part that really raises it to the level of being a competency. And when we realized that what we really want students to do is to influence the world around them, this critical thinking one has a lot of um, credibility to, to me anyway. So if you, then we would run them through a, a system of saying, is it relevant? Is it cognitive demand? That learner-centric one is the part that means, can a student look at this and see, hmm, would I know what to do? Can a teacher and a student negotiate that path for the student. And then we realized that there really has to be a gradual release. There's no way that we're going to do this um, with all students and be able to just start them where they are, even if they're 16 or 17. There has to be a, we're going to do a little bit together, we're going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of free reign, and then we're going to move on a little bit more. And then at, by the time they've gone through a couple of those, they would be able to. So through that gradual release, as that's going on, we really want all of these, these um, universal constructs, 21st century skills, to be foundational to everything that we're doing so that each one of our competencies 
as they're working on a math competency, science competency, they're also working on at least one or more of these. So if, if you just stop and, and ask yourself, what would be different if every student from our school could leave equipped with those skills that we just talked about, the creativity, critical thinking? What would be different for the teachers? How would it affect the outcomes for, if they knew they could really affect outcomes for, for students? And what could they be doing differently? What would happen for students? How would the school be different? How would the day be different if they're working toward those? So then we needed, when we started to ask that question, we realized, well, then how would we know what is happening for each student? So we started writing these scoring documents, and this is stringing a three-page document onto one page for you here to show you um, the competency, what it, a little bit of an explanation, and then broken out into skills, and each one of the skills has a list of gateways with progressions that move them through the system especially the universal construct ones would be K-12 so that they're ready and we can begin to talk about them with students and teachers. What is this, what is this really um, looking like and sounding like in my students at this level and what do they need to really move on to the next level? And we're, we actually will have one of these for each of the um, each one of them. We've drafted some algebra ones, some math ones. We have 13 for math. We consider these as the four that are algebraic. And so this is where I'm saying I realize that you don't have time to read all these, and they are at they are posted at that website at the bottom of the screen under a competencies tab there. So, but if we take the functions of algebra and do them with into e work them into each one of these and students doing them in different ways, then we have a completely different way to look at a math class. Same thing with, um, these are the geometric ones. And we say geometric and algebraic rather than geometry and algebra because we don't want them to really be associated with a course. We want them to associate with learning. The interesting thing about this conversation, we brought together experts from across the state, high school um, math teachers, college math teachers, pe well, people who taught methods of math at the university. And as they began to gel in their conversation about what is it that we want them to know and be able to do in 10 years, so when they started to talk about geometry, they said it's not about geometry, it's not about numbers, it's not about math, it's about life. It's about making logical choices and having evidence and having measured correctly in every decision that you make, which I found completely fascinating. Um, as, as many years out as I am from ever having taken geometry, I remember that it was about logic, evidence, and measurement. So then we leave some of these decisions up to the districts. We are writing state model competencies. They're available. So the districts have to ask, will they use them? Will they, will they write their own, start with standards and clump them into grades or subjects? What are their, uh, will they have cross-curricular? So will they have a capstone project? None of these things are left up to the districts. Another question I get a lot is what happened to the learning progressions, and I hope you saw those in the scoring documents, and we didn't have those developed early on, but they were there. And then quite often we're talking about, so how do we make this happen? And I don't know how much you've heard about blended learning, and some of you may have even read the new book by Michael Horn and Heather Staker, but blended learning is how we're going to pull this off. We're going to actually use the technology that we have to personalize and bring this together. And the book I was talking about is this one based on that philosophy that, yes, there's some things out there that are disruptive right now um, from Christensen's work, but not quite where we need it to be, but it will be, and we're, we're branching off into this. But these blended learnings are taking the best of what we know about what kids need to learn and the kinds of things they need to have in order to go on and do with these competencies, what they need. So there's background information. There's 
there are those key things that people are concerned about and saying, well, how will they ever learn these little these little tidbits and facts and the background things if we're just off doing projects or off in the community doing community-based learning? But Blended makes it, helps us have that happen, and it's really a formal education program that has they you use some online, they're sometimes at the school building, and they are also student-centered. They Students are learning the pathway. In this process, oh, I should go back to that one. In this process then, they are, the teacher is using each one of those computers as a, kind of as a teaching partner so that if I'm struggling with something and you're doing really well, then you can move on and I can be sent back into other ways of learning what I need to have help with. But that frees the teacher up then to be a facilitator of those projects and other things that are happening among all of the different groups that the students have been a part of um, along the way. So I want to offer these resources to you, specifically those three that are highlighted there, um, Delivering on the Promises of Story of Chugesh, Alaska. In Chugesh, they started this process in the early 90s. It's a, it's a place to really take a look at. That's a very old book, and sometimes you might look at the copyright date and the information in it and say this might not be useful. But it is because it, it's a great place to start a conversation. Even uh, some of our districts have had board studies where they've looked at what is it that we, um, they, they've gone this chapter at a time, and what is it we mean by competency-based. Theirs is really standards, and they talk about developing standards. So some of those things that we already have are standards now. And then here's that blended using disruptive innovation book that talks about the how we're going to make this get this to happen. And then the one that I'm really excited about right now, this community-based learning awakening the mission of public schools. This this is a pretty much a how to really engage your community in what is it that you need them to be connected to learning and students to be connected to them. Five levers um, is talking about how to make sure you're pulling the right lever at the time. Changing your bell schedule is not going to make this happen. Don't change a bell schedule until it's something you're doing pushes up against and says we must have the bell schedule change. Uh, Leader's Guide is, a, is another good one. And then move, off the clock, that's Rose Colby and um, Fred Bramante's book. And I'd also like to give you then these references. I know you've already had um, a conversation with um, Susan Patrick if you've been on the series, but that's the website that is the go-to website for everyone in competency-based education. So um, make sure you get connected to that. And then our Iowa site is just a place where we're, we're dropping things now so that um, people have access to them. And then when we transition to this um, for um, the framework that we're developing, we will be able to, um, we'll probably drop this site, but right now it's kind of a holding place, so if you're interested in looking um, for that, the other one, when we get it ready, will actually be on the Department of Education website for Iowa, and there's an alphabetic um, reference there where you can just go to C and find competency based so that'll be easy to find once we have something. We're expecting to have the, something there on getting started and stakeholder engagement by the beginning of next calendar year. So we're getting excited about that kind of work. And Marsha, I've talked through all of this already so I would turn it back to you. Does that mean that you can pull it back to yourself or I'm supposed to do something? No, you, we can actually leave it on your slide if that's okay, um, because that allows people to kind of get caught up with. In fact, I wouldn't mind if you um, clicked back a couple of the resources page. I'm going to go back to that at some point as well. But okay. um, I, I can see we're going to have a question coming in here. But one of the things I thought we could do with your permission is to put these resources up on our website um, next to the recorded webinar so that people can just, you know, click on those, um, you know, and, and kind of go to these resources because this, this looks fascinating. That would um, be great. They're the, live links, but they can't get them out of a webinar that way, I don't think. Right. That's why I thought I would put them on our website so that they can just click right there. You know, I'll make them live. <laughs> we'll put them Good. in live so that so they can do that. Um, just delivering on the promise. Now that is 
that was just kind of referred um, to me by one of our local Michigan schools that is in the risk group. Is that is that am I remembering that correctly? Is that kind of yes. Risk, risk um, Reinventing Schools Coalition grew out of um, the Chugach, Alaska experience. So those are some ah. of the same people. And now they are um, a part of the Marzano's Institute. So Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's exactly. And they're across the country helping people make this transition. They're a little more standards-based, like I said. They're not necessarily, and, and that's one of the things that makes Iowa a little different from other states is that we really are writing these competencies and then attaching standards rather than starting with our standards. We have our standards. We're responsible for them. We will include all of the standards, but we're starting with that. What do you want them to know in 10 years? What do you want them to take with them? That's interesting. What... Go ahead, Lisa. Did, did there was a question, but you can go ahead and yep. ask the question first. Well, okay. I was just going to ask you if you had any sense of what percentage of states are doing more standards based and what percentage are are not, but not you know kind of more like you. Uh, well, I think most of them who are doing competency based are using standards, parent standards, priority standards. Um, main calls them measurement topics. I don't know. I don't know of another state that's writing these type of statements that we're writing, uh, with and combining them together like this. And it, so I guess that means that it's really an experiment, and and maybe we've bit off more than we can chew. But we really are invested in this and believing that this is the way that we need to go. Excellent. And I see that we do have a question in the chat from Mike about seeing um, age and grade levels disappearing at elementary, and and I would just say that right now I I don't necessarily see it's not happening it's they're not disappearing, and I don't know that those age groups are necessarily that they need to disappear because if the students are moving through what they need to do it doesn't matter what age what room they're in if the teacher can help them move or if they can redistribute kids like um, one of the schools in Maine has their fourth fifth and sixth graders in in one building and they have nine classrooms and for math every three weeks they do a dipstick and they move those kids to nine different places according to what their need is at that time so one student might have only six or eight kids who have a very specific need another teacher might have 27 but they're all in the same place, and so they're moving somewhat together. And um, so those kinds of things are happening across the country where we're saying, let's regroup them according to that, but they still have their room of fourth grade or approximately 10 or 11-year-olds or whatever they're, they're moving through with. Andrew, part of you, one of the, go ahead. Go ahead, one of your slides you had, um, the, the school districts that are participating in your collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, now, are those the only districts in Iowa that are um, offering CBE, or those the only ones who are partnering in the collaborative? The collaborative, the schools applied to become a part of it, and we only had slots for 10, so that was all. But we do have other districts investigating it and moving toward it, and we have many districts. I wouldn't even propose an, a percentage of districts who are standards based or standards referenced and with the several of them I know of with the long range goal of once we understand our standards then we're moving toward competency based we're going to begin to move these students through when ready we're going to really begin to work on our universal constructs or those 21st century skills and um, move in that direction so there are many more who are working toward it Okay. How many districts are in the state of Iowa? I think it's 348 this year, something like that. It's, we're one of those states that still has a lot of districts, a lot of small districts. We do too. In Michigan, <laughs> we have lots of them, <laughs> very small ones. Um, so, you know, one of the, you obviously see this as a movement, in quotes, that isn't going to go away, right? Right. I, that train has left the station. 
I, I honestly believe if we don't get on, we're going to be left behind. I, this is the way we're going to get education caught up with the world and get our help our students be ready for the world they live in rather than preparing them for sorting and separating isn't working anymore. That's what mm -hmm. we've been doing for a hundred years. And we can't just say 25% go to college, 50% go to here, 25% do this, because everybody needs to have something post-secondary. Everybody needs to be ready for something. And when I say post-secondary, I don't mean everybody needs to go to a four-year college. But everybody is going to need something, and they're going to need to be prepared for continual learning. I, the One of the things that I see this doing for students is helping them learn their own learning style, putting them in charge of their learning, and helping them to learn and adapt. And if the career they chose when they were 19 or 20 goes away, when they're 32, they know how to adapt, they know how they learn, they know how to go out and find what they need to change. And hopefully they will have recognized the careers going away and have done it before it actually happens as the world you know, changes. It's, in, it's interesting because what you just said is what I, when I was teaching in the classroom and then started teaching for Michigan Virtual like 15 years ago, the thing that struck me the most is how um, accountable yeah, each student became individually and how the ownership they had with an online because it was one-to-one. -one. And this takes it, you know, a, many steps further, but it's striking how it just automatically, I mean, because you, you're you communicating one-to-one -one with a kid. I realize we're not, we're not talking about necessarily doing that because they're still collectively together, but in a way you are because you're looking at individually what they're each doing. And in the online environment, that's what struck me. I'd go in my classroom and I was still trying to individualize, but I still had a room full of 32 kids. But when I came home and started working with the kids individually, I mean, they took responsibility. They had to. They couldn't hide behind anybody. And they loved it. They loved it. Exactly. That and with, especially with the Anytime Anywhere learning, they're going to have to take responsibility for that. And what we've been seeing is they want to. We, had a, we have a school here. Mason City has their middle, their intermediate school. Their sixth grade math teacher started with blended learning so that students could be online learning the fundamentals and then doing beginning to do other things with him or, or working at least at their own pace. And he began to have emails at 10.30 on Friday night saying, hey, I think I passed this. You have a chance to look at it. Let me know. And um, he had one student who the mom called and said, why does she have two hours of homework every night? She's doing math. And he goes, I didn't give her homework. And she said, but she's on the computer two hours every night. And this, and the the young girl, the girl was just so excited about being at her own place and moving forward that she was really working through. Wow. What happened for that girl was, uh, she had come in as an average math student into sixth grade, and when he promoted her to seventh grade, he sent her to advanced math. She, and her standardized score at the end of the year showed three years of growth. And the oh other interesting, gosh. his classroom had two and a half years average growth that year. Only one student in all of his classes wasn't proficient. And that student I was telling you the story about is an African American from a single parent home. So two of the demographics that we're really trying to reach for, for kids, um, we're, we're seeing those kinds of things happen with students that who, who who are excited about learning, encouraged to learn, and involved in their own learning in ways they never were. Students who hmm. were squeaking through, beginning to say, but I don't even want just proficient. I want advanced. How do I become advanced? Hmm. That's great. That's what um, gets me up in the morning, brings me back. Yep. <laughs> it's exciting. Yes. Sandra, there's another question asking how Iowa credentials learning for um, things that take place in the community. Well, do you offer point, credit for them? Yes, yes, they can offer credit for it because um, our credit now, we have the option of the Carnegie unit, so you still can have your regular way of school because we're in this transition, and I imagine we'll probably leave that. It, it could be that way for a long time. I, I doubt Iowa will ever mandate 
this. It, I mean, it could happen, but I doubt it. Um, it. It'll be the Carnegie unit or this. So when a school, and it's up to the individual school to decide when credit is awarded. So those, um, the learning that takes place in the community is connected to the school. It still has to be a licensed educator who determines the credit it should be awarded. So it comes back into the school and the teacher makes that decision. So the 4-H person that I was talking about before with the clothing example or whatever doesn't come to the school and say, I taught this kid clothing and you need to give them credit. They bring the garments and the student and maybe have some kind of an interview or a demonstration of here's what I, do, here's what I can do. And the teacher then who's licensed to teach that content area awards the credit. So if, the same thing with the junior high student. If you have an eighth grader or a seventh grader who's earning credit at the high school level, if the teacher who taught that class is not licensed at the high school level, they have to coordinate with the high school teacher because the high, if high school credit is going to be given. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. And we realize that this is going to push against teacher, teacher licensure too. And um, our board of educational examiners, um, the director of that, is very interested in our work and very favorable to our work. We just haven't pushed any of those lines yet because we're just not ready and we, we don't feel we need to do that yet. And there, But there may come a time. You said that you brought in Fred Bramante early on. How Was that a game changer did that it was I'm, it was because it gave the state board a vision um, to say wow this is really incredible this is something that's changing things for kids in New Hampshire and we need to investigate and that's when we started that um, that first task force that was for the state board and had what I think one of the big things was when we had 300 people sign up in two and a half hours they knew the state is ready <laughs> to make this kind of a change. I'm wondering, have you seen anything, um, have you seen a need to change the configuration of a school? Uh, I know when, when we look at project-based learning, we now have architects out there who really, if, if you start from scratch, they will build a school that looks very different than you know they traditionally do. Would you, if you could build a school right now that was, you know, where it, that was based on CBE, what might that look like? The physical building. I would be very excited to start from the ground up with a new school. <laughs> um, and and yet at the same time, I wonder, would we build it forward thinking enough? But um, and and how much do we need to? build the building because we really need to be using the community. But we do have mm -hmm. one of our schools, Van Meter, which is just to the west of um, Des Moines here. And they are working on remodeling. They have a, a pretty old building. I, I don't know when it was built, but it, it was smaller classrooms. And they are working toward removing the inside part and making a big open area with class smaller classrooms than around the very outside and this big open area in their secondary part of their building is where there will be tables and chairs and um, couches and and places for students to gather plenty of electrical outlets for their laptop computers their one-to-one -one school we have about a, a maybe 120 of our 300 and something districts are one to one at least at the secondary, and that may be even more this year. I'm not sure. Um, so they're opening that up so that the morning they will have classes for students and things places where they're actually assigned to be, and then the entire afternoon they're planning to be project based, and they're working toward. <laughs> just those, well they call them the Van Meter vision points, they're working toward those 21st century skills um, in those projects and then connecting the standards to whatever the project comes up to. Some of those projects will be out in community and some will be just students in the schoolroom, teachers connected to the projects and um, as facilitators of learning. I'm excited to see how that works because the yeah. space does make a difference and we've compartmentalized ourselves way too much. 
that's what we're seeing in one place. And oh, and actually, um, that the ones in Mason City I told you about with the incredible um, achievement things, he he's now going together. The science and social studies teacher for sixth grade started doing this last year, and this year they're going to have um, the English teacher that works. So they'll have the four content areas. They're going to get a group of students at the same time and be together and do the blended learning with the some of the content online and then do project-based learning with these sixth grade kids and they've moved that group to an old band or orchestra room I can't remember which it is so they have this big room where they're going to have all these kids so they're they're experimenting with space in that kind of a way without building a new building hmm. without remodeling Interesting. Uh -huh. yeah I Trying to get over the hurdles of what we've put ourselves into <laughs> by thinking out of the box, right? <laughs> thinking outside the box, even though we're living in the box every day. Do we have more questions coming in? Yeah, I don't see any. Um, does anyone want to have their microphone opened up, or do you have any other questions? We're happy to, to either answer them through the chat or open up a microphone if someone would like to talk with Sandra. If not, we can... Sandra, one of the, uh, questions, that, one of the questions that we get a lot with um, as districts are moving is uh, the funding model. Um, it sounds like, are you still funding based on students being in a classroom? Or is that, is that how Iowa funds? Iowa funds according to the number of students in your, yes, in your school, and it's so many dollars, and we have a, an equal funding so that um, there's a, a limit per year per student. You could, um, it's between six and seven thousand dollars now, I think. Um, so yes, that's all still there. That's actually one of the problems with higher ed is the funding. Um, it's all funded on credit hour. It's funded by there, there's um, so many credit hours a student has to take in order to be a full time student and keep their loans and all those kinds of things. So funding is one of those background issues. We haven't run up against it too much yet. Uh, our goal, one of the things that people talked about early on, was in a competency based environment, you could probably graduate a lot of kids early. And my response to that is then you're not making your high school rigorous enough. Uh, there, there really needs to be a reason. It needs to be rigorous and relevant, and this will do both and give students opportunities where they would be engaged and learning, and maybe they can be earning college credit at the same time, but um, not necessarily graduating early. If students graduate early, of course, the school loses money anyway. So I guess you don't really want to graduate all your seniors a year early. That would that would chop off a lot of money from the school. But um, <laughs> but yeah, funding is an issue. Eligibility. Maybe I should go back to that one since we have a time have time. I I didn't say it too much back there because there just seemed to be so much to get out, and maybe I just talked through too quickly. But one of the things we're discovering, at least in Iowa, in working with your athletic association, is that our, one of the big problems we have is what is an incomplete? Because at the end of a semester or the, even the end of a grading period, a student may not be at the level of proficiency that that's being worked for, So, um, but might have been able to earn a C or even a B but is continuing to work on that so it's January and the student the semester is over it's basketball time and the student can't play because they're not complete if you put an incomplete down then in our system that means they're ineligible but one one of the ways we're experimenting with that and working with the association is that there are two and they said at the association it depends on your definition of incomplete at the district. So what we've done, what at least one district, Spirit Lake, is, has done, is they have not yet proficient and insufficient work submitted. Not yet proficient is playing, is eligible for sports activities. Insufficient work submitted is not on what Maine calls teacher pace or not, um, not doing um, what is expected of the student and that's when they're not eligible to play because they need to be focusing on their schoolwork. 
there's another issue with that with scholarships for college and NCAA and all of that but they like I said they're at the table and they're having the discussion um, I Nagel, Susan Patrick is working closely with them thank you certainly a lot more issues come surface as uh, you know you move down this road um, it's interesting because it wasn't until I got into the consulting end of things that I realized the impact that NCAA has on education it never occurred to me so I'm glad that you know <laughs> really that. <laughs> really is a, a, a big influencer and and it makes sense if these kids are going to get scholarships that we have to pay attention to that because it affects their lives Exactly. It, sports is very entrenched in our in all the way in our system. So mm -hmm. it's something that we need to pay attention to. Yep, and work with it. So, are there any other questions um, that anyone has? I really, this has just been fascinating. And like I said, I would like to um, follow up with you, um, at, you know, at some point. Uh, that kind of have some other questions kind of from the legislative side of things too. Um, Drew Halbert says, extremely informative. Thank you. I agree, Drew. <laughs> it was great. Oh, thank so, you. I, yeah, I feel like I talked really fast. I wanted to leave time for questions, and um, but I don't and think... there were good questions. I mean, I think this was just perfect. And, and as a, you know, you've got your contact information on there so we can follow up and there's no telling where, you know, when Lisa and I started putting these together, we were going to do six, and um, it grew to ten. <laughs> so there's no telling where this is all going to go. So we may, um, get, you know, kind of get back to you. I like what Mike just put in here. We can listen really fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so well, well, you, you if you well, listen you to so the much. recording, you, I was just going to say, if you listen to the recording, you can stop and start it. Yes. Exactly, exactly. That's what I love about that. Slides. So thank you. And, and again, I just want to um, thank our sponsors again because we, we always appreciate um, the work and support they give us, Michigan Virtual Academy, Think Space, Michigan Virtual University, and EdTech Specialists. So thank you, Sandra. I'll be in touch. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.